So like Dr. Karani said, I'm one of the internal medicine chief residents at Mount Sinai Morningside and West. It is a true honor to be invited today to the IME Grand Rounds to share a simula simulation-based educational curriculum on non-invasive ventilation and high-flow oxygen system that we had the privilege of developing for our internal medicine residents. And before I begin, I wish to extend my sincere appreciation to Dr. Salonia, Dr. Kurtz, and the entire CAMS family for their support and guidance in bringing this project to life. And of course, to our Manzana Morning Sun and West Residency Program and the IME for generously funding my postgraduate course uh, for Harvard Macy. And I'd like to start with some disclosures that I do not have any conflict of interest to disclose for this learning session. And actually there will be no discussions of drug use involved. So my curriculum stemmed from the recognition of the lack of knowledge and training in advanced oxygen modalities that was highlighted during the pandemic. And as we all know, we had an increasing use and uh, in increasing importance of non-invasive ventilation and high flow oxygen system. But there was the lack of confidence amongst physicians and nursing staffs, often leading to a delay in patient care and unfortunate burnout amongst respiratory therapists and ineffective use of resources as a whole. And simulation-based education, we already know, provides a safe and controlled environment for trainees to practice and refine their clinical skills, especially for high acuity clinical scenarios like acute respiratory failure. And many studies have reported that simulation-based education not only enhances clinical skills, but it also directly leads to improved patient care and clinical outcomes. And in fact, many undergraduate and graduate programs have adopted simulation training to improve clinical knowledge, procedural skills, teamwork, and communication. Acknowledging the effectiveness of simulation-based education, our current internal medicine residency curriculum mandates all residents to undergo an hour-long simulation session every six weeks during their ambulatory block. And recognizing the educational gap on the topic of advanced oxygen modalities and the personal interest in pulmonary and critical care medicine, I utilize our current residency structure to develop a simulation-based curriculum. The goal of this particular curriculum was to create a platform for internal medicine residents to improve their knowledge on various oxygen delivery systems, become more familiar with equipment, and increase understanding of physiology and application of NIV and high flow. The entire curriculum was conducted at Mount Sinai West at the Center for Advanced Medical Simulation, CAMS, uh, from February to April 2023. A total of 118 residents were enrolled, a similar proportion of residents from PGY-1s to PGY-3s. And each session consisted of four to seven residents, resulting in a total of 16 sessions over eight weeks. And uh, to reflect the different learning abilities, separate sessions were held for PGY-1s and senior residents. The curriculum itself consisted of three components. Firstly, a 20 minute PowerPoint of an initial didactic component was delivered by a critical care attending. The slides discussed management of acute respiratory failure, physiology behind different oxygen modalities and indications and contraindications of NIV and high flow. Then the residents were introduced to one NIV and three high flow machines utilized in the hospital, where different parts of the machines were explained and they were given an opportunity to fam familiarize themselves with the equipment. Then we had a 20 minute simulated case-based scenario incorporating high fidelity simulation modalities aimed at training the learners in the clinical application of oxygen delivery systems. The case consisted of the sim man having worsening hypercapnic hypoxemic respiratory failure. And the challenge we had was appropriately escalating the patient to BiPAP and increasing the IPAP, so inspiratory positive airway pressure to increase the delta gap, which would address the insufficient weight-based tidal volume and worsening hypercarbia that the patient was having. And we had a checklist that was predetermined uh, and utilized for all the learner assessment. Lastly, we had a shared post-event debrief session. And I just wanted to share the checklist that we used during the simulated scenario and also the debrief outline that we had for all the sessions. The debriefing sessions lasted approximately 10 to 15 minutes and were conducted by a critical care attending and a CAMS faculty. 
and predetermined learning objectives and individual group feedback were discussed in the debrief session to enhance clinical performance. In order to gauge the effectiveness of the curriculum, each resident was asked to fill out two uh, session, uh, post pre-session and post-session survey on REDCAP. The pre-session survey was conducted before the initial didactic session, and the post-session survey was completed after the simulation-based scenario and debriefing. Subjective and objective areas were assessed with multiple questions, and learner subjective comfort with NIB and high flow was assessed with survey questions utilizing the known Likert scale. For objective knowledge on acute respiratory failure management with NIB and high flow, both surveys comprise of the same seven case-based questions for direct comparison. And in order to evaluate a long-term retention, a retention survey was distributed three months after the completion of curriculum, consisting of similar subjective and objective questions. And a total of 60 residents completed the retention survey. And after the session, learning materials consisting of important take-home points and graphics illustrating various equipment manipulation were emailed to residents, aimed to assist them during their uh, real-life patient scenarios. And relevant journals and a link to an online module were also included to supplement their education. So when we an analyzed the results, we saw some great things. The pre-session survey showed that most, like 86% of the residents, had never received a formal training in NIV and high flow. And the same number reported having needed assistance from respiratory therapists or senior physicians for titration of the machines. Around one third of the residents reported having arbitrarily titrated the NIV high flow settings without really understanding the reasoning behind it. And when asked about the comfort level, only around a third reported having felt comfortable managing a high flow nasal cannula NIV and this improved to around 90% in post-session survey. When tested about the objective knowledge with case-based scenario, there was significant improvement in all areas. The biggest improvement was seen in the question that reflected the simulation scenario itself on appropriate ad adjustment of NIV in the setting of worsening hypercarbic respiratory failure. And the tested areas otherwise were uh, included uh, correct ad administration of CPAP, high flow, indications, and contraindications of BiPAP, and appropriate escalation to intubation. In terms of the retention survey, a total of 60 residents uh, it, were involved in the survey, and it was conducted three months after the curriculum. Almost all reported feeling more comfortable managing high flow and NIV since the simulation session. There was an improvement from 86% to 57% when asked about having needed help from respiratory therapists or pulmonary and critical care subspecialists for titration of NIV and high flow. And on testing of objective knowledge, higher percentages were demonstrated in all four questions when compared to pre-session survey results demonstrating effective retention from the simulation session. So what does this all mean? A severe education gap in the area was indeed demonstrated in our pre-session surveys with only 14% reporting previous formal training and high percentages of incorrect answers were also demonstrated, especially surrounding the use of NIV. So it is uh, there is definitely a need for a standardized educational curriculum on NIV and high flow to improve knowledge, skills, and clinical application uh, of these oxygen delivery systems for patients with acute respiratory failure. Our study also uh, was a good example of a successful implementation of a novel high fidelity simulation based curriculum, which addressed this critical educational gap and demonstrate a significant improvement in internal medicine resident comfort and knowledge in the application of these oxygen delivery systems. Our significant results can be attributed to a few things. Firstly, the initial learning objectives and didactic contents were relevant and appropriately targeted the needs in real life situations designed with expert views of the PCCM faculty. In particular, the simulation session reflected a common clinical scenario, yet incorporated a challenging component of BiPAP manipulation. Moreover, having separate sessions for different learner levels, the PGY-1 separate to the PGY-2s and 3s, also allowed tailoring of the content effectively meeting individuals' needs. We had a debriefing sessions, 
that address the predetermined learning objectives and learner questions, affording one an opportunity to reflect and target any observed gaps. The debriefing e effectiveness has already been proven with previous studies affecting task performance, knowledge, and cognitive effort. And lastly, information retention was enhanced with written handouts comprised of visual illustrations appropriately designed to assist IM residents in the management of NIV and high flow in real life. We certainly had some several limitations too. Although the format of each session was the same, the delivery of the content, simulation sessions, and debriefing sessions could have been a little different depending on the CAMS faculty running the session. We attempted to minimize the variation through the standardization of educational material, predetermined educational objectives, and an outline for debriefing. We chose a scenario utilizing a BiPAP given the larger learner discomfort surrounding the modality compared to high flow, but we do recognize that there is a need to create a high flow case in the future. Lastly, though the retention surveys demonstrated high percentages, results may not truly reflect learner retention as only half of the initial cohort completed the surveys. Our novel High fidelity simulation based curriculum educated the residents on the recognition of patients with acute respiratory failure and the management of these patients utilizing NIV and high flow. The curriculum was a prospective cohort study, which showed a significant improvement in both comfort and knowledge. The, our study showed that high fidelity simulation can be effectively utilized in similar settings with goals to improve knowledge and skill among physicians, eventually leading to better hospital resource allocation and improvement in patient-centered outcomes. And with that, I would like to again thank the CAMS faculty, our residency program, IME, for an opportunity to develop the curriculum and share with the rest of the health system. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bak. Thanks for that introduction. Um... I believe I shared my screen now. Uh, thanks, Dr. Karani, and thanks to everyone at IME for helping to support me through this program. It's been fantastic and a great supplementation to my last year as chief, I'm sure similar to G. Um, my project was similar to G, simulation-based, and it was a simulation-based approach toward teaching the mechanical ventilator uh, focused to critical care fellows. Uh, I have no disclosures. Before getting into the presentation, I'll just do a, a brief background. Um, pulmonary and critical care fellows at Mount Sinai prior to this lacked a formal dedicated mechanical ventilator curriculum. Um, just a little bit of background. We have both pulmonary and critical care, which G and I are, and then we have critical care fellows who train, um, can come from all different types of backgrounds and don't necessarily have pulmonary embedded in their learning as well. Uh, we rotate in multiple different units, but overall the teaching is the same. Uh, we don't have a dedicated um, sit down curriculum, except for um, when teaching is often done on the fly, um, which is typically done during bedside rounds uh, when patients are either crashing or something critical is happening and things need to kind of move very quickly. And that has benefits and that has risks. Uh, some of the benefits in that are of teaching on the fly in certain situations are that these changes can be applied to a very specific patient scenario and it allows for great learning uh, as to why certain changes on the ventilator may benefit one patient but not necessarily benefit a different patient scenario and that the management changes on the ventilator can be performed in real time by the learner so you can change um, the PEEP pressure, you can change the FiO2 and you can then see the results that you're obtaining with the patient. There are risks however with this in that there are possible harms that can be done with mechanical ventilation. It's something that we are performing to the patient. And if we're not performing it thoughtfully, there can be definitely mistakes that happen and um, the patient can have complications. And also the fact what, what when we're doing things in real time, we have to make time sensitive decisions where, as I mentioned, patients may not be doing so hot and things need to be done, done extremely quickly. And if we don't have the knowledge base to back that up, we may again have some negative connotations to the patients. Besides uh, 
teaching that's done on the fly, other sort of traditional event learning is in the form of textbook learning. Uh, Martin Tobin is like wrote the Bible of mechanical ventilation. Um, and it's a very hefty book. <laughs> it's uh, been in my locker all year. I wish I could say that I've read all of it, but I haven't. Um, and then obviously, Human Poor also wrote um, another more shorthand book to the basics of mechanical ventilation. And this, this is a good review for going over any uh, ventilatory uh, physiology and respiratory mechanic physiology, which is obviously integral to know in order to make the best decisions on the mechanical ventilator. However, despite this, not just at Mount Sinai, but at all critical care programs worldwide, um, fellows are not satisfied with this vent curriculum. This is a study out of CHEST in 2008, where the authors had sent out surveys to, uh, I think, 150 different critical care programs, 108 fellowships uh, surveyed, uh, responded to the survey uh, in regards to their satisfaction with their curriculum for mechanical ventilation. And unfortunately, only 50% of fellows reported satisfaction. Higher satisfaction was reported for those programs that had formal uh, hands-on and longitudinal programs embedded into their curriculum. And the highest satisfaction was with simulation-based curriculums. There's a lot of positive studies regarding simulation-based te teaching of mechanical ventilation. Um, this was one of the studies that I found that actually had a control group uh, simulation-based teaching versus traditional teaching of the me mechanical ventilator. This was a study that was published in 2013 uh, for internal medicine residents out of Northwestern Hospital. This uh, intervention had first-year residents who participated in a simulation curriculum prior to their four-week MICU rotation and compared th that um, outcome to third-year residents who took part in the more traditional simulation teaching and then went on to complete um, post-surveys and post-clinical skills assessment. The simulation curriculum included um, common case-based scenarios that we may see in the ICU, as well as a 45-minute debrief after each case. The clinical skills assessment that was studied after the intervention and after traditional teaching for the third-year residents uh, included things like, are the patient, are the learners able to identify the proper mode of ventilation for each uh, case? Are they able to identify what the set title volume is? Are they able to dictate what initiates the inspiratory flow in each patient based on what settings they're on? And uh, the study authors had positive results. They found that the third, uh, sorry, the first year uh, interns who underwent the simulation curriculum actually performed significantly better than the third year residents who had been through almost their entirety of the internal medicine training already than um, in their clinical skills of handling the mechanical ventilator. Uh, pilot studies have shown similar success with sim curriculums on a fellow level. Uh, this study was published recently, just last year, out of Detroit, um, and it was a study of first-year pulmonary and critical care fellows who, uh, similar to our um, our, our program now, were started to take part in a boot camp at the beginning of their first year of fellowship, which included simulation-based case, cases uh, to teach mechanical ventilation. Um, they performed a pre-test, a one-month post-test skills assessment, and then an end-of-year skills assessment at about nine months into their first year of fellowship. The scenarios that they used, again, are common things that we encounter in the ICU all the time, particularly things like auto peep, which I'll get into in just a little bit, mucus plugging, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and then uh, ventilator dyssynchronies. And while this study didn't have a control group, they found that there was a great improvement. Excuse me. They found that there was a great improvement in the skills of these fellows after they participated in the simulation curriculum. So getting on to our program, uh, creating a simulation event curriculum for Mount Sinai ICU fellows. The main objectives of this project for me were to establish a sim-based curriculum to teach uh, critical care and pulmonary critical care fellows the intricacy of mechanical ventilation 
in the critically ill patient in a safe environment and to ultimately create a curriculum that may go on to be expanded to be utilized for residents, nurses, respiratory therapists, NPs, et cetera. Based on the cases that we utilized, I had a more specific objectives for our learners, which were to recognize three common causes of high peak pressure alarms, Oops. implement recruitment maneuvers to improve gas exchange in ARDS, and manage hemodynamically significant dynamic hyperinflation. Um, two patient cases were scripted to mimic these common scenarios. And we utilized the STAR Center in our uh, Mount Sinai main campus um, in the basement, which is the Simulation Teaching and Research Center, which has the SimMan 3G simulator, which is pictured here. Um, attached to a, this isn't the exact vent that I used, but a Puritan Bennett 840 vent, which is more of the older appearing vent that we have here in the hospital. Uh, in order to get the most, I guess, realistic experience to the scenarios, we attached an ASL 5000, which is seen here on the right on the picture, uh, to the ventilator circuit. And how that works is it basically, you can change the settings on the ASL 5000 to mimic any sort of real life patient scenario. So we can change the compliance of the system. We can uh, change how much effort the patient is putting into each breath. We can make the patient apneic. We can make, make the patient tachypneic, et cetera. Oh, that's what I said. Here's an example of what the ASL interface looked like when I was setting up the cases. Um, here on the left, we have certain custom or automatically set scenarios. So we have COPD, we have ARDS, and we have asthma. Um, we have an interface here, which is uh, what the learners looked at in terms of vitals. And then uh, I didn't utilize this portion as much, but is what the vent waveform would look like. I didn't utilize this because we looked at the actual vent. Besides this actual set interface, we can make more minute changes to the compliance of the respiratory system. And then this, excuse my, um, these aren't the best images, but we can also uh, change uh, things like the set breath rate. So for example, if I wanted the patient to be over breathing the ventilator, I could set the innate breath rate at 36, or I can make the patient apneic, et cetera. Uh, each of the cases that we wrote ran from about five to 15 minutes each and had anywhere from three to five learners in the room. Following each, ses each session, a 30 to 45 minute debrief was performed and prior to the session, pre and post surveys were completed. I'd like to get into the cases in a little bit more detail since I have a little bit extra time. Uh, the first case was a case of ARDS. Uh, the, the learners were provided a learning prompt and then entered the room. The prompt was a 70-year-old male that arrived to the ICU after being intubated in the ED for acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. Uh, the learners were uh, called in to assess a high peak pressure alarm. In the room, the objective was to diagnose ARDS and to make appropriate changes to the vent settings to optimize their oxygenation and to reduce trauma, such as barotrauma and volume trauma from ARDS. To prepare for any possible scenario of what the learners may do in the room, I utilized a flow sheet. Uh, this was how I set up the case. So each learner was called in to assess a vent alarm. And the baseline vent settings were pretty standard uh, settings that we may see someone come up from the ED on. So like a low respiratory rate, a tidal volume at 500, an FiO2 of 100, and a PEEP of 5. Uh, the settings uh, on the ASL for this particular case were severe ARDS with a very low compliance at seven, and they were apneic as they had just received paralytics uh, post-intubation. Um, let me see if I can get this video to play. So the learners are called to assess a high peak pressure alarm. This is what they see when they go to the ventilator. Sorry, it's a little shaky. Um, but the peak pressure was greater than 60 on these settings. Um, ignore the title volume. Um, I, I ended up changing it later on. The FiO2 was set at 21, uh, just of note, because that was the only way we couldn't get 
the alarm to, we could get the alarm to stop alarming as we didn't want to actually utilize 100% oxygen in this case. Uh, the learners then go on because of the peak pressure being so elevated to check a plateau pressure. And you can see that when they check the plateau pressure, you get an actual result based on what the compliance is in the system. So it's a very high plateau pressure based on the low compliance in the setting of severe ARDS. So that was how I set up the case. Um, this was my flow sheet, as I mentioned. Um, I wanted to be prepared to see how the learners would react to this, or, to this case. Ultimately, the goals of the case I'll get into in just a little bit were to protect the lungs from volume trauma and barotrauma. And so things that we needed to do were to decrease the tidal volume. Obviously, if we decrease the tidal volume without an appropriate increase in the respiratory rate, um, the patient would become um, hypovent would be hypoventilated and they would um, have a low pH and a high PCO2. So ideally, we wanted to go down in the tidal volume, but go up on the respiratory rate. Um, if we went down in the tidal volume, we would have seen that the peak and the plateau pressures would actually be improved. Um, I also wanted to have the learners utilize recruitment maneuvers. So when we went down in the tidal volume, they would be at a safe space in terms of peak and plateau pressures that they could potentially raise the peep slowly over time to see if we could improve the compliance of the lungs by recruiting atelectatic lungs. Things that they could do besides just slowly increasing the peep would be to bag the patient. That would also work, and that would have resulted in improved compliance of the lung. So the peak in the plateau pressures would slightly improve and the oxygenation would actually increase as well. If the learners weren't doing anything and felt kind of panicked, uh, the vitals may have potentially gotten worse, the peak in plateau pressures could have gotten worse and the patient could have developed a pneumothorax or a possible respiratory arrest, which then they would have to deal with. After this particular case, we did a debrief. We utilized the PEARLS healthcare debriefing tool, which is the promoting excellence and reflective learning and simulation tool. Um, what we did is we brought the learners back into the room with the rest of the learners that weren't also participating in the case and asked the learners to kind of set the scene. So tell us what they were walking into, what they were encountering, how they felt to certain situations, and to describe the changes that they were making on the ventilator in order to let, let share with the rest of the room what changes they were making and why they thought that would be beneficial. If there was any questions that arose, we would then kind of probe deeper. You know, I see you went down on the title volume. Why did you do that? Because the learners may be doing things for certain reasons, but not necessarily know the actual data behind it. Just know that that's what you're supposed to do. So this allowed us to kind of cement, um, I guess, more data-driven care in terms of ARDS. So again, uh, the things that I hammered home for this case were to, if the peak pressure is high, one, check the plateau pressure to see if we're dealing with a compliance issue. Um, to protect the lungs by decreasing the tidal volume based on the ideal body weight. So we want to do six cc's per kg of ideal body weight or less. Uh, if it's safe to do so, to perform recruitment maneuvers to optimize compliance, to see if atelectatic lung could potentially be recruited. And if nothing worked, to potentially consider things like proning. Our next case was a case of asthma. The prompt that the learners received was a 23-year-old male who presented with a viral illness and developed hypercapnic respiratory failure in the ED and ultimately became obtunded, which prompted intubation. Uh, we're called into the room again because of a high peak pressure alarm and are finding that the patient is over-breathing the ventilator. The goal is to identify dynamic hyperinflation from severe status asthmaticus and make appropriate changes to the ventilator. Obviously, the setting that I started on the ASL was asthma in this particular case. And they were, oh, this should say title volume, excuse me, but the, the vent settings that the patient started on were similar to the previous case with a low respiratory rate, a title volume of 500, and a PEEP uh, PEEP of 5 and an FIO2 of 100. 
As I mentioned, the, they were in a moderate asthma state on ASL with high expiratory resistance and semi-normal compliance. And as I mentioned, the patient was over-breathing the ventilator, so the innate respiratory rate that I set on the ASL was actually 36. What the learners needed to realize was happening was that because the patient was over-breathing the ventilator, they were developing higher and higher levels of volume in the chest, which can lead to critical levels of intrathoracic pressure and can lead to things like attention pneumothorax or cardiac arrest. So this was something that potentially may have shown up on their screen if they were not acting fast enough. Uh, the take-home points for this case were to do anything to optimize the expiratory time. So in someone that was breathing at the set rate that the ventilator was set at and not over-breathing like our particular uh, case, we could decrease the respiratory rate, uh, do something to decrease the inspiratory time, which would be things like increase the inspiratory flow or use a square waveform rather than a descending ramp waveform on the ventilator. And then in someone who was over-breathing the ventilator, one of the most important things to realize is that you needed to sedate or sometimes even paralyze the patient. So the learners often would reach to that when things were not going their way. Uh, the few other things that we drove home in this particular case is if the patient's unstable, um, which ultimately this patient may have become if they did not act fast enough, uh, the best thing to do would be to disconnect the patient from the ventilator to allow adequate time for expiration. And sometimes you can even press on their chest to allow for assistance with the expiratory flow. Uh, the other thing that we somewhat brought up, depending on how the case went, was to discuss the uh, arterial blood gases. Patients in this particular case um, are very hypercarbic and may have a low pH, which is okay as long as the patient is hemodynamically stable and not air trapping, because what often is most harmful to these patients is the tension within their chest from the dynamic hyperinflation rather than a mild hypercarbic acidemia. Uh, so getting into the results, Ultimately, over the course of several different sessions, I had 20 surgical critical care fellows and 15 pulmonary critical care fellows complete the curriculum. Uh, 15 total pa uh, fellows completed the post-session survey. Both qualitative and quantitative feedback was obtained with the use of a Likert scale, uh, usually from strongly disagree to strongly agree, or things like uh, bad, very good, excellent, et cetera. All of the learners felt that the STAR Center was a comfortable place to learn. 93% strongly agreed and 7% agreed. 93% of the of the learners agreed that the instructor, me, was organized and prepared. 7% uh, agreed. And 80% uh, of the learners strongly agreed that the debriefing sessions enhanced their learning. 20% strongly agreed. In terms of asking if their knowledge gained would be helpful in their practice, they 100% strongly agreed. They also 100% strongly agreed that the knowledge gained would improve patient outcomes. Overall, they found this course excellent or very, or very good. Getting into the qualitative feedback, I uh, did a thematic review of the uh, free word, uh, free text typins that we got. And some of the things that they brought up were that it was a good review of physiology of respiratory mechanics and good physiology review of the vent, the importance of closed loop communication and talking out loud, the ability to recognize dynamic changes to the patient as they happened, a good review of auto puke management and asthma management, and the importance of avoiding anchoring. And lastly, they felt we need more SIMS. In conclusion, a simulation curriculum to the mechanical ventilator is safe and enjoyable to critical care fellows. Vent sim sessions can improve fellows' knowledge of the intricacies of mechanical ventilation, and they may even help improve patient care. Next steps are to expand the curriculum to medical residents rotating through the ICUs, to create additional case scenarios, and to ultimately write up our findings. 
I want to thank the IME again for their support in sending me to the Harvard Macy course, which helped a lot in developing this curriculum. And I want to thank Jared Kutzen, who was instrumental in introducing me to the Star Center and very supportive in teaching me the intricacies of the Sim Man and the ASL, uh, which were not easy for me to learn. I also want to thank my pulmonary and critical care department, especially Tom Tolbert, who introduced me to Jared and Sakshi for always being as supportive as she is, as well as Human and Dr. Aqua, who helped teach me the mechanical ventilator. And lastly, I want to thank my co-fellows for letting me uh, experiment on them. Thank you, and I'll take any uh, questions. These are my references.